So, hello everybody. Um, my name is uh, Sonali Paul. I'm one of the um, transplant hepatologists over at University of Chicago, and um, I think the American Liver Foundation for asked me to present on a topic um, on patients uh, with uh, primary biliary cholangitis. And so, um, oops, used to not be advanced. There we go. Um, and so uh, this will be mainly patient-centered, but we'll talk about kind of the definitions of uh, PBC, the diagnosis, um, the management complications, and then also um, in terms of liver transplantation. Um, and I just bring this up because PBC, there isn't, there hasn't been a ton of research done, and so it is considered somewhat of an orphan disease um, because it is fairly rare. So first um, thing, a few about uh, two years ago now that the changed the name of PBC. So it used to be called primary biliary cirrhosis. Um, but uh, this, of course, made many people very anxious because it wasn't actually that uh, you had cirrhosis um, or scarring of the liver. Um, and so they changed the name um, to primary biliary cholangitis. And so not everyone that has PBC actually has cirrhosis. Um, what we believe is that we know is that it's an autoimmune related disease. Um, and so it's the body kind of attacking the liver itself. Um, it involves the small bile ducts in the liver. And so the bile ducts are the highways that drain bile from the liver um, into the small intestine. Um, and these are the really small ducts that you can only really under see under a microscope um, that are affected. We don't entirely know what causes it. We think there may be a genetic component because um, it does run in some families. Um, and there's potentially been some studies looking at environmental links um, because it's more common in women, they think it might be more common with cosmetics, nail polish, urinary tract infections, and the antibiotics that women get from that. But it's all very um, hand-wavy, and um, not a lot of research has been done in terms of that. In terms of the natural history, um, it's a chronic disease, um, again, affecting the bile ducts, and it can progress over um, many years um, and eventually lead to cirrhosis or scarring um, of the liver. Without treatment, um, early in the disease course, um, it's not great. There's only about 60% tenure survival. Um, and then with symptoms, um, the median survival is five to eight years. But as I'll talk about a little bit later, the good news is, is that we have a great treatment, actually two new treatments out um, that has really um, halted the progression of PBC. We know that bilirubin, or one of the liver tests, is the best predictor of survival. So we use that often to look to see um, how progressive the disease has become. And the good news is, is because we know about it now, um, it's being recognized at earlier stages. So we're treating it earlier, which is re uh, resulting in decreased liver transplants. So in terms of diagnosis, um, again, it's chronic cholestasis. And so when you look at your liver tests um, and your doctor checks them, the alkphos is usually elevated, or the alkaline phosphatase. Um, but you can also have mild elevations in your other liver numbers, including the AST and the ALT. The alphas is a little bit more specific to the bile ducts, where the AST and the ALT are a little bit more specific for injury to the liver itself or the liver cells. Um, antibodies or autoantibodies are very important um, for patients with PBC. Uh, the anti-mitochondrial antibody is very important. It's called the AMA. It's very specific. Um, about 95% of patients will have a positive AMA. That if it's negative, though, it doesn't necessarily mean you don't have PBC because there are 5% that are AMA negative. Um, and then there's also an anti-nuclear antibody and an anti-smooth muscle antibody, which are other um, um, kind of autoimmune markers that can be seen in 50% of patients. And then there's something called an immunoglobulin, um, basically proteins in our bodies that kind of fight, help us fight infection. Um, and in PBC, I don't know entirely know if we know why, but we do see an elevated IgM level. In terms of diagnosis, um, on, usually we see patients that come in because they have abnormal LSTs. Um, the physical exam is mainly normal. Sometimes you can have a big spleen or splenomegaly. Um, and then in the later stages, you can have yellowing of the skin or jaundice. Um, and then these xanthomas or xanthelasmas, and basically they're little cholesterol pockets that form. Um, and it can happen actually form anywhere, but we usually see it around the eyes. Um, and then in terms of kind of biopsying um, or liver biopsy, it's, it's fairly controversial. And I think there are really two schools at camp, and it depends on how you were trained um, to think about PBC. 
um, if you do biopsy, you'll see inflammation of the small bile ducts under the microscope, and they, they'll call it a florid duct lesion, or, or um, you can also see something called ductopenia, where the portal tracts are basically the bile ducts that contain um, are missing and, and kind of drop out because of the damage to the liver and the bile ducts. Um, and this is just a picture of a florid duct lesion right in here. You can see a lot of inflammation. So blue is bad, um, and these are the bile ducts that kind of go in here in the portal tracts, and so there's a lot of inflammation around that area. Um, so our society guidelines, the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases, or the ASLD, <clears throat> has guidelines for the diagnosis of PBC, and, and they usually require two of the three following criteria. So either um, an elevated alkaline phosphatase, or that liver number we have talked about, um, the positive antimitochondrial antibody, or um, evidence seen on liver biopsy. So um, you don't, again, necessarily, if you have a positive AMA and you have a high alkphos, that's kind of the diagnosis has been made. But again, I can tell you, um, so I like to biopsy. I was trained to biopsy patients with PBC. And not everyone, obviously, if people are very sick or they have other reasons or they're high risk for bleeding, um, I'll, I'll use my judgment. But for the most, I'd say 90% of the patients that I see, I like to biopsy. And mainly because I want to stage their disease um, because if they're, uh, a biopsy can tell us how much scarring or fibrosis there is of the liver, and if stages one through four, one being not very much kind of a normal liver, um, to four being um, a lot of scarring or cirrhosis, it helps me kind of see the prognosis and, and how aggressive we have to be and how much monitoring there needs to be done. Um, and then there's other reasons, too, because you want to rule out overlapping um, fatty liver disease or any kind of other autoimmune hepatitis process that could be going along with PBC. In terms of clinical manifestations, um, fatigue is one of those vexing symptoms that we see a lot. About 80% of patients will come in with it. There's really no correlation with severity of disease or duration. 20% um, of these will be thyroid-related, so it's important, as I'll talk about, to have your thyroid checked every year. Um, and there's really no good treatment available. Provigil is um, uh, one treatment. Um, it's expensive, though, and not all insurance companies will um, uh, will approve it, so it's um, not the best. And puritis is also another symptom that's a bit more specific and, and really problematic. Um, it's usually worse at night in, in the heat in the summertime and during pregnancy as well. Um, and there are medications for it. Unfortunately, the, the rifampin and the naltrexone that we sometimes use can also worsen the liver um, and the liver function, and so we only use it um, in patients that are um, fairly well compensated. Um, with their liver disease or they're doing okay. Um, and then other things, antidepressants and antihistamines are also used often. Other things, so PBC runs with kind of rheumatological issues. And so there's something called Sicka syndrome where you can have dry eyes and dry mouth. Um, and then other things like scleroderma, really thickening of the skin, um, Raynaud's phenomenon, which is when in cold weather, the tips of your fingertips can get really painful and change colors. Um, you can have dysphagia or trouble swallowing. And then also what we talked about was hypothyroidism as well. And so um, a lot of times uh, if your clinical suspicion for PBC isn't there, but you, you know, if you see someone with, that has these rheumatological issues, then sometimes they'll think, oh, maybe PBC is higher on the differential. Um, and again, uh, the end stages of PBC, you can develop something called portal hypertension, or basically when the liver gets scarred enough um, and it gets scarred down and you get something called cirrhosis, you can get portal hypertension, or basically high blood pressure in the liver. The liver can't um, process the blood as it flows through because of the scarring. Um, and this can develop in patients that have either stage three or four fibrosis. Um, and the main th reason, well, there's lots of reasons we worry about it, but one of the big things is that um, it can develop, you can develop esophageal um, or gastric varices. And varices are basically just veins that form because the blood can't flow through the liver. Um, they find passages to go through, and one of those um, passages it forms is into the esophagus and stomach. And if uh, varices were to bleed, it actually becomes very dangerous. And so we like to actually go in and take a look to see whether they have varices early on then we can either treat them or put them on medications. Um, and then in terms of other clinical manifestations, hyperlipidemia or high lipids, um, what's interesting is that it's not the bad cholesterol um, that 
uh, is affected, it's actually the good cholesterol. So patients can get high HDL levels. Um, and there's actually not an increased risk of death from cardiovascular disease, which is good. Um, but oftentimes the cholesterol still might be a little bit high and, and statins or um, cholesterol lowering drugs are always okay um, in these patients. We also worry about um, metabolic bone disease and just vitamin deficiencies. And so osteoporosis and osteopenia are important things to um, think about in pa patients with um, uh, PBC. So bone density score should be done every two to three years. Um, and osteoporosis can happen in about five to 10 patients. So sorry, that should say PBC. Um, and uh, treatments are usually calcium and vitamin D for osteopenia and then bisphosphonates um, for osteoporosis. And I usually refer those folks out to endocrine to help us with the bisphosphonates. Other things we wanna look at are just fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies. Because bile helps us, um, bile, which is found in the bile ducts, helps us absorb fat-soluble things, or fat in general. Um, because the bile isn't working as well in patients with PBC, uh, you can get fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies, um, including vitamin A, D, E, and K. Um, and so because of this, we like to screen patients every two to three years um, for these deficiencies. Um, vitamin D deficiency is pretty common in the United States in general, but I picked up a lot of vitamin A and E. Um, and vitamin A is especially important because it can cause a lot of night blindness. Um, so it's important to look for it. In terms of special cases, again, I think we talked about this, but there is an AMA negative PBC, um, which can be found in 5% of patients. Um, labs and the liver biopsy are usually identical. So you'll have the al high alk FOS and, and the liver biopsy will show the florid duct lesion with a lot of inflammation near the bile ducts um, and um, uh, you know loss of the bile ducts. Um, but the AMA or the anti-mitochondrial antibody will be negative. Um, here you can also have a positive anti-nuclear antibody or an anti-smooth muscle antibody, so the other autoimmune markers. And this really requires a liver biopsy because otherwise you won't be able to see the bile duct damage. Um, and then there is also an autoimmune hepatitis um, overlap with PBC. Usually the um, AST and the ALT will, will be a little bit more elevated than the ALKFOS. But on the biopsy, you might just see a lot of interface hepatitis. And what we usually say is what the biopsy shows the most of, if it's predominantly PBC, then we treat the PBC and kind of see what the liver tests do. Um, and if it's predominantly autoimmune, we kind of treat the autoimmune first and then kind of see what the liver tests do. Um, and then the treatment for autoimmune would really be steroids. And so um, I have to be hard pressed to believe that there's some interface going on um, to put someone on steroids um, first for autoimmune. In terms of treatment, treatment is great um, in PBC. So there's ursodiol, um, which is a naturally occurring bile acid in our bodies. We just increase the um, concentration of it with the ursodiol. Um, it's usually dosed by from th 13 to 15 milligrams per kilogram per day, usually in two divided dose. Sorry, uh, two divided doses, but you can usually take it at the same time um, all at once. It doesn't really matter. Um, and we know that this improves biochemical um, indices. So specifically, the alkphos gets better. Um, it can delay the histologic progression, so the progression onto a more advanced scarring or cirrhosis. It improves liver transplant-free survival. So patients that are on ursa don't usually need a liver transplant. Um, it can also decrease variceal formation, um, but not necessarily bleeding. And then with ERSO, um, liver transplant-free survival is actually pretty good. It's 85% at 10 years and then 66% at 20 years. So a really great medicine that we have with very few side effects. Um, the biggest side effect that we hear about is some GI upset or diarrhea. Um, there is a new medicine that um, has come out, a beta colic acid or OCA. It was just recently approved um, and it's really used um, for patients that have an inadequate response to ERSO. And so where the ALKFOS is still kind of greater than two times the upper limit of normal um, or people that have side effects to ERSO. Um, it doesn't really, well, it's, it's new, so it really hasn't looked at improving survival or disease-related symptoms, but it does improve the numbers. And if we know that if you improve the numbers, you can usually um, prevent uh, progression to cirrhosis. Um, unfortunately, though, the side effect is puritis, and already a lot of our PBC patients already have puritis or itching, um, and so it's hard-pressed to kind of sell them on um, OCA if they already have a ton of itching. Um, but just the caveat is that studies didn't really do any liver biopsies when looking at um, um, a beta colic acid, so it's unclear whether it actually can help with um, disease progression. But the theory would be yes. 
so in terms of screening family members, um, I usually say all first degree relatives should be screened um, because we do know that there might be a genetic component. So it's mainly women um, because it's more common in women, but I advocate for men as well. And so it should be done kind of equally. So anyone that I see with PBC, I tell them that any first degree family member should get um, screened. And then, um, uh, and the screening should really, can really just consist of LSTs or liver tests with an annual physical. Um, and then uh, if the liver tests are elevated, um, you can get a anti-mitochondrial antibody. So in terms of PBC and liver transplantation, um, what's interesting is that in the 1980s, so it was the leading indication for transplant in the US, but currently it's decreased by 20% and so because mainly because of the advent of erosodiol. Um, and right now it's the sixth leading indication for liver transplant. Um, and it's also the most favorable outcome for liver transplantation. Um, and so only about 25% develop recurrence. Uh, and even if you develop recurrence um, of PBC in, in your transplanted organ, there's really no impact on survival of that, or, um, of that organ or of the person that, that gets that organ. So um, it's actually, uh, of all the kind of liver diseases to have, it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a good one to have because there's a, there's a good treatment for it, um, as indicated by the impact of URSO just on liver transplantation. With that, um, I'll stop there. So thanks for your attention. And if you have questions, certainly always contact um, the uh, Sarah at the Liver Foundation, and then there's the link for the American Liver Foundation, the Great Lakes Division. Thanks for your attention.